Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, More Than VM Backup, Any App, Any Data, Any Cloud. I'm Kirsten Stoner, a technologist at Veeam Software here, and today I'm joined by um, my friend and one of the original vanguards, I would, I would, I'm thinking, right, Dave? Um, Dave Kula. So how are you doing today, Dave? I'm doing great. Thanks, Kirsten. It's great to it's great to finally get a chance to do a, a webinar with you. I know, you know, we've known each other since the start of the the Vanguard program and even before that. And uh, I'm super excited today. This is a great topic that we'll be that we'll be going through. I know this is our first presentation to, together, so this is exciting. So um, today, you know, we're talking about more than VM backup. There's definitely more to VM backup. Um, so we wanna start thinking about, you know, how we're protecting data today. And what is in your IT infrastructure? So you have, you know, your physical server, your virtual servers, your hypervisors. And then you also have, you know, some different backup targets. You on-prem, maybe you're backing up, storing that data into the cloud, um, immutable backup targets. And all these components need to be protected, monitored, and secured. Um, what do you think, Dave? Is this how you're seeing a lot of your, you know, clients protecting their data today? Is this um, the typical, you know, IT environment? Well, thank you, Kirsten. It's, it's it's a great point, right? Because we've traditionally looked at um, the type of data that we protect in the infrastructure coming from the sources that you mentioned. You know, those physical servers, virtual servers, and you know, something dies, something breaks, and we need to fix it. And we, we've had great tools like Veeam to help us with that over the years. And, and this is really the, the traditional approach of, of how we look at data protection and kind of what I'll call it traditional data center, but the landscape's changing. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about today because your data can be in many more places than just what's on the list. It could be cloud, it could be anywhere. So. You know that's that's kind of why we're here today is to is to dig in a little bit to those other intangibles that we need to think about. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point, Dave. And that leads us into you know data. You think about data. Businesses are running on data and they're collecting data on almost everything: websites, social media, um, electronic payments, user habits. You know, we've all experienced that time where you know. We're talking about something that we need, you know, hey, I need a new planner. I open up my social media app. Well, guess what? There's apps for, there's ads for planners. So businesses are collecting data on everything. And this is going to help them with make better business decisions, uh, better business decisions, um, you know, market to their customers, market to new customers, really gaining customers. Um, improving processes, understanding how um, you know their applications are performing, maybe how much they're selling. I'm really helping them you know solve these problems today. And with the growing importance of this data, we want to make sure that you know we're ensuring it's available, it's ready for businesses to use when needed, and um, you know it's protected as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just kind of back to that previous point there, Kirsten, um, the other thing is, is not only having access to that data, but also knowing where that data is so important, right? Because there could be a lot of regulatory or compliance reasons that, you know, we need to not only be able to back it up, protect it, but we also may need to have to delete it on demand if that request comes through from the end user. Yeah, definitely. Data is, you know, growing and it's residing in uh, a lot of different places. And with the amount of, you know, the exponential growth of data and, you know, the different places where you're going to be able to store data, you're going to have to ask yourself, how are you protecting this? Um, it's not just going to be on a physical box anymore or a virtual machine, but maybe it's in the public cloud. Maybe you're running containers. Um, how are we making sure that it's protected and secured and also managed properly? So with this comes more challenges. Um, you have data residing in multiple places. Are you monitoring? 
Are you having that visibility into the data that allows you to address any type of issues before you know downtime or data loss? Think about protecting that data um, in case of an outage or a failure, maybe a natural disaster happens. How are you protecting it? And then also, you know, managing it. You know, are you you're collecting it, your storage, you're storing it, but are you also, you know, really managing it properly and having the tools in place that, you know, allows you to get more out of your data? And you never want to skimp out on security, right? So I know, Dave, you've had a lot of stories about how you, you help keep data secure. Um, what do, do you have any tips about how to overcome these data challenges? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is, is that, you know, data is really the new currency that's out there. And so when we take a look at, you know, what threat actors are targeting, they're not necessarily even caring about the physical infrastructure that they're impacting. They want to get a hold of that data because with that data, they have the ability to take and then hold us hostage, hold us hostage by, you know, ransomware. Maybe it's even a ransomware less attack where they're just trying to exfiltrate that data and then try to blackmail us that they'll release that data out onto the dark web. And, you know, we probably have a lot of attendees here today, uh, Kirsten, that have probably had to go through this, unfortunately, with their organizations today. And so my biggest piece of advice for organizations right now when it comes to security is, you know, you need to have some type of modern threat protection, advanced persistent threat protection put in place to monitor what's happening to your data. So if you have a large amount of data that's, you know, leaving your network, those notifications and alerts need to be actioned. Somebody needs to do something about that. So one of the big things that I'm finding organizations looking at coming into 2022 and moving forward into 2023 and beyond is the investments that they're making in their cybersecurity operations teams are at uh, kind of an un unseen level that we just, we haven't seen this before where, you know, the spend is up. I, I always tell organizations, kind of a funny story, you know, there used to be a, a funny saying back in the day that nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And so now I like to say, nobody ever gets fired for spending too much money on security. So that's kind of the new, the new norm that we live in today. Yeah, that's definitely for sure. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more within our presentation as we go through our PowerPoint. But we do have a question and it relates to the slide before this, um, making sure data pro is protected no matter where it lives. So the question is, um, Dave, maybe you can take this one. Um, how does IET get started figuring out about all the places that data could exist outside of their current um, on-prem uh, IT infrastructure? Well, I think the, the, the biggest piece of this, and, and it's a little challenging for IT is, Sometimes we take the approach that, you know, IT has been given a list of things to protect. And so that list had to come from somewhere. And so we do a good job as IT. We're told to back up and protect 100 VMs. We back up and protect 100 VMs. We've got the following web apps to protect. We, we protect them. But one of the things that's changing in kind of the modern landscape of, you know, IT organizations and just organizations in general is the fact that the business is now, you know, driving a lot of these decisions as to, you know, the apps that they'd like to use and or integrate with. So my biggest piece of advice around that question is start the discussions with the business today. Make sure that, you know, IT is not considered kind of an outside entity. IT really needs to be a partner inside of the organization. Get a seat at the table find out what the business is doing, find out if they're going to use that next great cloud app that's coming up and ask the tough questions. Like for example, okay, great. This new HR app that we're going to be using, this is really going to change. It's going to be a game changer for us. We can do so much. We can manage resumes better. We can do all of these things. Ask the tough questions. Where does the data reside? How is the data protected? And most importantly, ask this question, what happens if that service provider themselves gets ransomed? 
can we sustain an outage with not having access to that cloud-based data for an extended period of time? Because we've all seen this happen. There's been outages in the biggest cloud providers out there today. So just rehashing that, get a seat at the table, make sure IT is a partner and ask those tough questions. Yeah, that's a great answer, Dave. So when we think about, you know, today's modern data challenges, um, one thing that we want to start rethinking is, you know, backup and recovery. Um, is your backup solution going to be able to protect all the area where your data is living, on-prem, virtual machines, in the cloud? You know, also thinking about, you know, what what is your business doing? Are they thinking about you know migrating to the cloud? If once you get the data there, once you're starting running those machines in the cloud, um, how are you protecting that those machines? Do you have a solution that's going to help you protect um, everything that you have, or are you going to have to start using multiple tools to protect it? Um, we talked a lot about ransomware and data security already. This is something that is very important for businesses today to have. A strategy in place before it they're ransomed, you know, have that security set up around their data before it happens um, is, you know, a really good defense mechanism to have before <clears throat> instead of waiting until after, you know, setting up those um, boundaries today in place. Also, thinking about disaster recovery, um, it's not only, you know, a natural disaster, but it could be a cyber attack as well. So, having your workflows set up in place before that disaster happens so that you can easily one click uh, fail over to that disaster site um, when that happens um, is a great strategy to have. Uh, monitoring and analytics, being able to get that visibility into your infrastructure, um, your virtual infrastructure, your data protection environment, uh, making sure you know, you're monitoring those machines, their resource usage, making sure that your backups are actually, you know being backed up, meeting your recovery point objectives, um, all can be something that can be done through a monitoring tool um, within the data center. And then you know, reusing that data, we are storing more data. Can you reuse that data and get more out of it for forensic, run security analysis, maybe you have to do some e-discovery. Um, that's an important part um, of modern data protection today. We we're, we're really wanna get the, use of our, the best use out of all of our data that we can. So no matter where the data lives, it should be protected, physical, virtual, in the cloud. Um, you wanna be able to protect everything everywhere and that's where we're you know, really talking to today. It's just making sure that no matter where it is that you can you know, restore, maybe you wanna, maybe you have a physical machine, that physical machine goes down. How are you going to restore it? Well, you know, you have a, some options. You can restore it back to a physical machine. Maybe you need to restore it to a virtual machine. Maybe you want to restore it to the cloud. Um, so you want to make sure that you have that no matter where the data lives, uh, it is protected. So we have a lot of different applications that are running in the data center today. And, you know, businesses rely on applications to think about. You know, when every, I know from, from experience, you know, every morning I log into work, I'm logging into, you know, Microsoft 365, I'm accessing my exchange online, I'm using Teams. Um, all this data is important for my everyday, you know, work. If that wasn't available to me, it would actually really hinder my progress in my job. So. These applications that, that we rely on today are very important to be protected. Wouldn't you agree with that, Dave? Yeah, absolutely, Kirsten. Especially when we look at you know the, the Microsoft Office 365 suite, um, I'm finding that businesses are starting to transition over to things like OneDrive for Business. And you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic over the over the past couple of years, you know, everyone in the world has been impacted by that. The the uptick in Microsoft Teams usage is in the hundreds of millions of users almost overnight. And so this is what I've found has happened with a lot of organizations that are out there. And I'll use just Teams as one small example. 
is as IT, we were told we have an we have an issue that's that's occurring right now with COVID. We're sending everybody home. Um, let's light up Teams. That's going to be our unified collaboration source. And Teams just as like one tool. There's many others that were out there that that organizations were using. But inside of Teams, oh wow, we can take and we can create channels. Oh, we can share documents. Um, where is that stored in the back end? How is that governed? Um, what happens if you know that that channel gets accidentally deleted and you know now all of a sudden we're going past our recovery times that are set by default inside of our office 365 tenant how are we now going to protect that so it has had to come kind of in behind all of this and say listen modern data protection and recovery is not just your emails in your office 365 and exchange online it is now just uber important data that's living in teams which is actually back-ended inside of sharepoint sites as is you know OneDrive for business we want access to those files anywhere anytime and so the the example for OneDrive for business during COVID-19 that that I saw Kirsten was I'll take one employee for example the organization had to downsize because of COVID-19 and they laid off half their staff many organizations around the world face this problem you know they were working with governments to try to keep employees on, but the unfortunate reality is they, they probably had to lay them off. And in as part of that layoff, they wanted to reduce their licensing footprint. So like, okay, we've got these laid off users. Let's let's you know let's release these Office 365 licenses. And so now they've released these Office 365 licenses, and six months later they're like, okay, we're ready to rehire everybody. Um, yeah. So we'll go reactivate your license, and if your um, if your data retention policies weren't that long, that data could be lost in the cloud forever. So you're almost starting from scratch. Well, wouldn't it have been nice if you would have had a backup of that data? So now we could at least restore what that user had. And uh, I heard a very interesting term with one of my clients yesterday, and it was called transitory data. It's actually the first time I'd heard that, transitory data. I'm like, well, what does that mean? It means data that is not necessarily centrally protected or backed up. So they were using OneDrive for business as transitory data because it was it was something that they were not actively protecting. They didn't have a solution in place. I'm like, well, if we have the ability, why wouldn't we just protect that? So those are a couple, couple little examples. And the other piece to this is, um, protection, not just in the cloud, but also for your custom line of business applications. I deal with a lot of organizations in the um, laboratory management and manufacturing sector, and we have a ton of custom written applications. And so we have to really put on our thinking hat as to how we're gonna protect those things, because I don't just wanna necessarily have to restore the entire virtual machine as the artifact every time something breaks, but that could be what we're having to do. So we have to really put on our thinking hats as to how and what recovery looks like for kind of non-mainstream things. So I'll hand it back over to you, Kirsten. Yeah, definitely. Those are all very good po points. And, you know, we do we do store a lot of stuff in OneDrive. I know I do. I mean, I um, use it every day, like I mentioned before. So. If something were to go missing or if I accidentally deleted something, I would definitely would want that back. You know, I have important information in there. <laughs> so good, um, definitely good points there. So um, with that, you know, we don't want to forget about our physical servers either. And it's not just necessarily a physical server, but we're also thinking about our desktops. Like you mentioned too, um, desktops, uh, laptops, you know, with COVID, we all took our computers home. We, we're all working from home, we're working from our laptops. And the, that information that's being stored on their laptops for you know some organizations, um, some of their users can be really important. Um, we might also have specialized applications that are running on our laptops to for certain uh, processes our businesses do every day. So you know it is really important to remember to protect our physical. Um, it might be easy to forget about them, but we don't want to ever forget about those. Am I right, Dave? Yeah, 
Absolutely, absolutely. And and so um well, I do like storytelling, Kirsten. So I'll give I'll give the viewers another little little story here. Um last week, uh my wife Crystal and I both work in IT and we were on site at uh at one of our customers. It's actually one of the first times we'd been on site to customers in a long time. So that was kind of fun. It was almost a year and a half since we had a chance to visit them since the pandemic. But we were working in the engineering department, Kirsten, and uh, we had some custom software updates that we were helping them um, get deployed out to those to those desktops that they were using. And and I asked the question to them. I said, "This software takes an awful long time to install. Like this was custom software that was used for managing um, robotic cells out on the plant floor." And I said, "There's a lot of tweaks and there's a lot of customizations to this. How long is it?" before you really get to what we call a usable desktop, where this thing is actually functional for you. They said, Dave, believe it or not, it can take up to a week, a week of customizations and tweaks. A week, 40 hours to get this thing configured. And I said, you know what? And I told them this, I said, you know what? Your desktops that you work on here in engineering are just as important as servers. These things might as well be servers to us. And so we have to treat them as such. So we actually were able to set them up with um, Veeam Agent for Windows and protect them. And um, you know, shortly, shortly while we were there during that week, we actually had a situation where we had to change some hardware in one of those engineering stations. And we were able to use um, Veeam Agent for Windows and um, to transition the hardware, which was pretty cool. So we were able to actually move that image over. And the issue that we had there was they were running on a slower hard drive and we wanted to move over to an NVMe M2 uh, faster laptop. And you know we were able to just smoothly move that over and, and get that done. So now we've got a solution in place that it's not gonna take 40 hours to recover those things anymore, but it could take you know a matter of just an hour or even minutes to you know recover those things. So yeah, don't forget the physicals for sure. And remember, your your desktops are just as important as servers. Wow, that's crazy. 40 hours. I mean, that's a long time to have to be able to recover. Is that, um, I know I talked to you briefly last week. Uh, is that when you were over in Columbus, Ohio? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't Columbus. We were we were a little north of there, but um, yeah, it's absolutely and uh and so yeah and that 40 hours we forget about that because it's not just the 40 hours somebody has to do that work and our engineer and that paid salary might be not at his most efficient point as well so they might be having to do other tasks or could you imagine not being able to program that robotic cell for up to 40 hours that would be very significant the whole plant floor could be down it could just not be that like that desktop could impact hundreds of employees in that organization. And so, you know, we, like I said, remember, you're going to take the little gold nuggets out of the webinar. This is an important one for you. Remember, your desktops are just as important as servers. Yeah, while you were talking there, we did get another question that came in. Um, should an organization just looking just look at backing up all desktop desktops? I can't even talk today. I'm sorry. Should an organization just look at backing up all desktops? Dave, what would you say? You know what? I honestly believe in in the day that we, in the days that we live in right now with the cyber threats and having to help organizations recover from whole level ransomware attacks, we like to think that we can just re-image devices, you know. We've, we've got the ability now to quickly reset um, workstations and get back to kind of a vanilla build using things like Microsoft's autopilot or imaging techniques. But remember, these customized devices that are out there are the problematic ones. So I would say, first of all, look after things like those engineering PCs. And if you can find the space and you can find the budget, Honestly, I would actually just back up the whole lot of them because in the event that you do have some type of a ransomware event, you're not looking at necessarily re-imaging all of those devices, you could restore. Now, one important point to that is don't just keep like one week worth of data. You probably wanna keep a minimum of like 30 days. And so how I do it, 
for small engineering departments like this is we don't necessarily want to waste space on premium backup targets for desktop backups. So uh, what we'll do is we'll set up some local storage in the department and we can take and we can get some backups rolling off of, um, we can get some backups rolling locally in that department as well. Just make sure you secure those credentials. And one final key point here, Kirsten, if you have that data backed up to a USB drive, that's attached to that device, which is quite easy to do actually, make sure that you're encrypting it because you don't want somebody to just walk into the office and grab a copy of that intellectual property and easily be able to open it. So it's also important that we secure that data as well. So do make sure that you're actually encrypting that data yourself. Yes, great points, Dave. And you know, one of the things we also want to think about when we're thinking about you know backing up desktops, backing up um, our physicals is you know data mobility. A lot of times you know people need to be able to move that data around. If that you know maybe that physical desktop goes down and you don't have access to another you know desktop right away, maybe think about um, a physical computer. Maybe think about being able to restore that computer in a in a cloud instance. You know, just being able to, you know, get that data back and running. Um, you can think about restoring, you know, data or maybe even entire workloads, entire, you know, sites in the cloud. Um, it's always an option because, you know, the cloud is a little bit more scalable. Um, it's easy to, you know, spin up machines um, and get back up and running um, if needed. I know you were talking to me earlier this week about, you know, having that heart, hot, that hot DR site in the cloud. Um, what do you have any more thoughts about thoughts about that, Dave? Yeah, and and so the unfortunate reality, Kirsten, is I've had to be a member of over, you know, I think I, I've lost track now, but it's 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 ten, maybe fifteen plus ransomware recovery teams over the past two years, and so one of the big things is ha that happens is this: is that if you get hit, if your organization gets hit by ransomware, um, and you have a cyber insurance policy. What will end up happening is you have to contact the cyber insurance vendor. The cyber insurance vendor will bring in their forensic team to analyze what's going on. Uh, in a lot of cases, what we found is that we get locked out of the infrastructure because they're trying to find, you know, the, the point of origin for where that's coming in. So you kind of have to just not touch anything because it's forensic data now. And so the hard part about this is we're kind of down. If we had a hot site, a hot DR site, and we have the ability to take and restore to that hot DR site, while the forensic team is, is taking a look at what they're doing, maybe we can get key stuff up and running. Like maybe we can get the accounting department up and running. Maybe we can get the ability to, uh, to run payroll. Maybe we can run some payables checks. Maybe we have the ability to at least get into the key business systems because the bad guys know when to strike. They love to strike right before mid-month or right before month end. And that is a very painful time for any accounting department because that's when the bulk of their transactions have to go through. And so having the ability to just have that hot DR site available to us that we can restore to or just flip the switch and recover to is, uh, is really huge. And the second piece of this is um, let's forget about a cyber threat for just one sec. Let's say that we have some type of a natural disaster. We've seen unprecedented uh, wildfires around the world in, in so many different continents and just weather anomalies um, taking out our core infrastructure. And so, so with that has uh, presented a problem that COVID-19 has also introduced over the last year, which is supply chain constraints. We've tried, Kirsten, to order backup targets and hyper-converged infrastructure, and our lead time on some of that hardware is 120 days. So just trying to gain access to hardware is very difficult. So it makes this ability to do direct restores to the cloud or running that hot DR site in the cloud that much more attractive to businesses. And I found organizations that have maybe been a little bit on the fence when we tell them that, listen, even if you had the money and you wanted to order that hardware, 
you're still in the queue, you're still waiting. So cloud becomes a lot more attractive in those scenarios. Yeah, I've actually heard a lot uh, recently that a lot of the uh, businesses are really transitioning into the cloud. And, you know, for those reasons that you just mentioned, um, you know, those, that supply chain is not where it used to be. It's like a, like a back order. So we want to think about, you know, when we are transitioning into the cloud, you know, going beyond virtual machines, but, you know, protecting those cloud workloads as well. Many businesses have moved to the cloud, like I mentioned. Um, and I was just on the phone the other day and someone said that, you know, all their machines were running up in Azure now. And it it didn't really surprise me, but I feel like most of the time I'm, I do talk to a lot of uh, customers who have half and half, you know, they're, they're doing half on-prem still and then half up in something like Azure or AWS or even Google Cloud Platform. And when that data is there, it's still your data. You want to make sure that you are protecting it. You have restore options available to you, um, especially if you do lose a file, you, you lose an item. Being able to you know, restore that item to make sure that you can get it back um, is important to every business um, today. Do you see a lot of your customers, you know, um, your clients, Dave, like in the cloud, transitioning to the cloud? Um, how do you feel about this? I know you talked about it briefly on the previous slide. Well, I'm very passionate about this one, um, Kirsten, because I find that a lot of organizations that are out there today have gotten away with um, being able to just store data for what we feel is an infinite amount of time. And so nobody ever goes back through the core file servers, for example, and cleans them up. So my key piece of advice to everyone listening to this webinar right now is don't be a data hoarder. You can press, you can press the delete button. You can work with your business. There is a lot of data that's inside of there that's probably dormant, historical, can be archived off or simply just deleted. And the second thing is, is um, I find a lot of organizations taking large file server and the, the just multi terabyte file servers of data that they don't really know or understand. And they're trying to move it over to hyper fast, hyper converged infrastructure running all flash at a premium price. And I'm like, why are we doing that? Like half of that data, three quarters of that data, nobody ever touches. Why don't we look at a tiering model with something like Azure Files and pushing some of that up to some cloud storage and almost in a similar fashion to how we run one, moving that data there and looking at OneDrive. Maybe some of that user data can live in OneDrive and available and accessible to the users anywhere on any device. And that's also a big thing with you know data today. Users are demanding, Kirsten, that they don't want to have to log into a VPN to access their key and critical files. And so, you know, solutions like OneDrive for Business, for example, give them access to the platform. And so we're finding that the shift, I, I call it the great shift of data right now, is happening where we take what we used to know as data that would just remain on corporate file servers is now compartmentalized and pieced off but it's a process. I envision for many organizations that they're still going to have those traditional file servers for at least the next five years because it's a big job to take and move that off and migrate and kind of change um, the business process. And that's where it's got to be, you know, a lot of shared responsibility between IT and the business to figure out what exactly is going to happen with this. And file server migration projects have never really been ones that have been high on the priority list. And why, and how you get them high on the priority list, this is a true story. Go through a ransomware attack. I don't wish that on anyone, but if you take that corporate file server and every single file is encrypted on that corporate file server, and you unfortunately didn't have a good path to recover that, you may be we're looking at a situation where you had to pay that ransom, um, you're going to find out real quick as to which folders are important to you. It's not a very good way to figure it out, but you find out real quick the prioritization that the business has around those files in that, um, 
in that type of scenario. So you just have that tough discussion with them. You say, okay, listen, this file server gets turned off today how much does it impact your business? Like we're talking, you can't work at all. You can partially work or yeah, we can get by for a few weeks without that data. Um, have those conversations with them and really figure out what you're going to do with that data as it goes beyond the VMs and kind of shifts into cloud and any data anywhere. Yeah, those are great points, Dave. And that leads us into, you know, monitoring. Um, not only do you want to make sure you're protecting your environment, you want to also be monitoring it. Make sure you meet those service level agreements. Um, you can help forecast resource usages and identify problem areas. And this can help in any situation. Um, I know you can, you, you know, identify if a, a, a disk is running out of free space. Maybe, you know, a machine is, you know, acting slow. You take a look at your monitoring tool. You can see you need to add, you know, some more memory. Maybe you need to more add some more CPU. And you know, this is going to help your your machines, your critical applications, anything, you know, run better if you're monitoring how it's using those resources. And what helps with monitoring too um, is that you, when you're monitoring your environment, you can also, you know. Monitor your security in your environment. I know we've talked a lot about, you know, ransomware and cyber attacks, but you want to, this isn't something that you want to put on the back burner. It's something that you want to put in place today because um, it's never a matter of if a cyber attack occurs, but more of a matter of when. And there's a lot of different tools out there that can help with this. You know, you think about MFA, encryption, Usually utilizing something like um, an immutable backup storage, just making sure that data can't be changed or deleted um, and it's protected are all things that you should start considering today, if not already considered. Uh, I know, Dave, you, you've talked a lot about some of your stories um, so far, but is there anything that you want to add to this slide before we move on? Yeah, absolutely, Kirsten. If, if anyone, is dealing with a cyber insurance vendor, this is your hit list that you have to go through right now, working with your cyber insurance vendors. They are not going to take and uh, issue policies, a lot of them right now, without having some type of attestation um, towards multi-factor authentication for email, uh, even going as far as desktop logons, even going as far as server logons. I saw one actually come across my desk this week. It was in regards to backup and recovery. Are your backup and recovery environments protected for administrative logons using multi-factor authentication? And so that's, that's huge. And this is actually coming from the insurance companies because they've had to pay out so many claims. Um, when we look at things like the principle of zero trust and least privilege, you know, Microsoft is building this right into the platform in Microsoft Azure right now. Um, if you weren't aware of this, you know, you you look at spinning up a tenant. It's just a place that we store things in the cloud, right? It's our it's our space. That tenant can actually be secured from day one by using something called an Azure Blueprint. And Azure Blueprint is preset security guidelines that are going to meet all of your regulatory compliance. So instead of us chasing security and trying to get to the end game where we are secured, think of starting secured. I want to start secured instead of trying to get secure. Okay, it's a very important piece. And then um, the last one you mentioned is immutable. And I know that um, as as Veeam so great solutions out there for immutable um, uh, storage for backup targets. Even Veeam has their own appliances now that can be used, which is super cool. But I find that I'm I'm the old I'm the old guy in the room now. I have to admit this. And so I go back to the time when you know we used floppy disks and we used tape backups. And so we used to we used to call it uh, worm-based storage, right? Once read many. There used to be on those on those floppy disks, Kirsten, um, a little tab, and you could put like a almost like a little sticker over the tab, and you couldn't write to it anymore. It was like it was called write protecting it. 
the floppy disks you had to them the backups you could pop out a little tab on them so that you could you could make them immutable and so i find that this word immutable storage is something that's very confusing to industry but we just have to take a step back to 20 years ago we were doing this 20 years ago and so in doing that 20 years ago um, immutable is just on a new platform but it's the same idea as you know worm based storage man i do wish this i do miss using those floppy disks i i remember like you know back in the day you, using those to play like different computer games and stuff and good times um, so staying on the topic of security, you know, you want to be able to detect and then also respond to any abnormal activity. Um, if you're monitoring your environment like you should, you're going to see, you know, what's what's normal. And then also you're going to be able to quickly address when something does start looking, you know, a little abnormal. Maybe your CPU usage on the machine is increasing. Uh, maybe your network's being more utilized. Uh, maybe your backups are getting a lot bigger. Um, backing up that data and if that's you know abnormal to your business because you've been monitoring it for so your your you know your data for so long you know this is something that you can you know quickly help you know detect and then you know um, be able to perform the appropriate actions that are needed to isolate the incident before it you know starts going um, throughout your entire infrastructure uh, being notified so that you can um, you know, address this in real time um, can really help when you are experiencing a cyber attack. And I, I mean, you were talking to me earlier about how you've, how you've helped a lot of your customers with this, Dave. Um, what do you think about, you know, detecting and responding um, to, you know, a cyber attack? Oh, great, great points, Kirsten. And, you know, two points that I kind of want to bring up is the first one. It's so important for everyone out there today is being on top of your backups and making sure that your backups are actually recoverable by testing them is, is just critical because a backup that hasn't been tested or a replica that hasn't been tested is not a replica to me. So number one, make sure you're testing that. Number two is, as you mentioned, being able to proactively um, determine if an attack is in flight by looking at, for example, rate of change on a file server. Because one of the things that ransomware will do is as it's ripping through and, um, and ransoming your files, it's attaching basically a certificate inside of, uh, inside of that process. And it's changing the file extension on all of these files throughout the file system on the file server. Well, let's just say hypothetically that rate of change that's normal for a file server is 10,000 files modified in a day. All of a sudden you saw a spike. Now there's a million files changed in that day. Something's going on. So maybe before you ever even received the ransomware note, IT administrators and security operation and an, uh, analysts can go start looking at this. The second thing is, is in regards to detecting those anomalies, make sure that you've got advanced persistent threat protection on all of your critical assets, including your desktops, your servers, make sure you're monitoring all of your um, even core infrastructure like switches and routers and firewalls, um, because those are all fair games to the bad guys. And now what we see organizations doing is we we see them using cloud-based ai to do adaptive threat hunting to determine you know what systems are impacted and i'll, I'll give you a great example here kirsten um there was a, a log for j um, critical crisis that hit and so big exploit that came out we had to go find all these web servers that were potentially running um code that was going to create a zero day in holes for our organization and so in these new cyber insurance policies you have to actually attest that you have no log for j exploits that are out there well how do you prove that and in and more importantly in the middle of you know being told that this giant exploit is out there how do you quickly go find that and the answer is threat hunting so 
you haven't looked at threat hunting yet, make sure that you, you get yourself a good platform that'll do that. There's many out there um, and make sure that your cyber teams have the tools they need to detect and respond and you know do what they need to do to protect the organization. Yeah, definitely. And that leads us into, you know, what about disaster recovery? And one thing about disaster recovery is, you know, planning today is going to save you headaches tomorrow. Um, just making sure that you know which, um, when a disaster happens, which items that your business's, business needs to be recovered first, um, what workflow, workflows um, you need to have, you know, prepared to recover in a timely manner. Uh, making sure that your backups are meeting your recovery point objectives by testing, um, making sure that your recoveries are meeting your recovery time objectives by testing. I know you mentioned that, you know, in a couple slides it before, but having a tool that allows you, you know, plan in advance, something like the Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator that allows you to test your recovery point objectives and your recovery time objectives to notify you if you're meeting those um, is a great tool to have on your side, especially when it comes to recovering from a disaster. Maybe you need to recover to an offsite location, maybe a co-location facility. Uh, maybe you need to recover um, to uh, the cloud or, you know, maybe you're using a service provider. A service provider is someone that's going to be on your side in these types of situations to help you, you recover from that disaster. And there's a lot of different types of disaster. You think, you know, a natural disaster, fire, flood, um, snowstorm, tornado, um, all the all those things that you need to be prepared for in advance um, is definitely going to be beneficial to you. And then you have, you know, a cyber disaster. You know, it is a disaster when you know ransomware does get in, infected in your 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 infrastructure. How are you? What are you going to do? Do you have a a plan in advance to help with this. It's all stuff that you need to start thinking about if you haven't already. And, you know, Dave, the ransomware uh, expert, or I don't know, you, you seem like you're very you know, knowledgeable on the subject. Uh, what would you say about cyber DR versus natural DR? Oh, it, it's, it's such a great point and so important, Kirsten. Um, most organizations have a DR playbook that's already built out over the years for those natural disasters. And one of the things I'll get you to add inside of your natural disasters now is uh, power grid failures, because now there's more pressure than ever on the power grids and we're seeing rolling blackouts in, in places and hopefully your generators can sustain you know, those rolling blackouts. So let's add that into those natural DR as well. But cyber DR is, is a whole different animal. You almost need a completely separate playbook for that because there's so many different players involved from your cyber insurance vendors to cyber um, forensic teams that are coming in to recovery teams. Um, what you have to know about um, cyber DR is that take all of your infrastructure that you have and potentially you have to model this scenario as well. You have to model, and we we never we even want to think about this. You know, Veeam is a backup and recovery company, but I have seen threat actors actively target Veeam infrastructure as their number one thing that they're going after because they know that we can hit the big red button and we can recover. So that's one of the first things they try to take out is they try to take out your backup infrastructure. Um, our good friend Rick Vanover, Kirsten, I did a, a ransomware talk with him. And, and we had two years ago, threat actors go take our backup targets that we had that were running on NAS devices and quite nicely reset them to factory default. So it wasn't just somebody clicking on a phishing email and encrypting a few files, it was an active hack. And so they they found all that infrastructure and they they did something about it. They, they nuked it basically. And so that type of scenario was out there. And so the big thing that we have to remember with cyber DR is remember the bad guys are targeting our protected environments. So here's another gold nugget for everyone. I said earlier that desktops are just as much um, uh, in, are just as important as servers, especially certain ones. Second gold nugget I've got for everyone here in the in the session is that backup environments are just as much 
production as production. Because when you get hit with a cyber attack and there is nothing left in production, and now backups are the only thing that I have left to recover from or replicas, you need to make sure that those are protected and that those are secured. How are you going to do that? Number one rule, do not place your backup targets in your primary Active Directory forest and domain because if that forest and domain gets compromised, all your backups and replica targets just got compromised. That's number one. Number two is you want to make sure that you have some type of immutable storage locally as well as in the cloud to prevent overwriting of those critical files. And number three is you want to take and build out a separate fabric and a fabric is really nothing more than a separate Active Directory forest and domain. And that's where you want to store things like your critical hypervisors and your backups. And I've even seen, Kirsten, organizations take this to the extreme where they have a fabric for their, uh, they have a fabric that's set up for their backup in DR. They have a fabric that's set up for their hypervisors and they have multiple different attack vectors that they set up. So now you, you not just have to get into one spot, you have to get into many. And the, and the last piece here for cyber DRs, I really want you to question whether or not your servers need access to the internet. Because in a lot of cases, servers do not need to be internet connected. You can actually kill internet on servers. Um, you, some of them you'll need, to, you'll need to allow some level of access, but especially in the fabric, I really question how much access you need into the fabric. The only thing that really needs to get into the fabric from an internet perspective is access to uh, update servers and you can set that up. And the second thing is, is updates from your advanced threat protection provider. So yeah, that's, that's my piece on that is, you know, protect that critical infrastructure and you'll be okay in a cyber DR event, but that all needs to be planned for. And if you don't have that today, you, you best look at it because in the event that somebody compromises your domain admin credentials, I want you to just think of everything that would get wiped out. And if that wipes out your backups, you have a very big problem right now, and it needs to be addressed today. Yeah, yeah, those are all very good points, Dave. So Veeam helps customers unify their backup. It's the Veeam platform these days, so we can help protect and manage all workloads. So if you are running, you know, your work workloads and machines in the cloud, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, maybe you are, you know, getting you're dipping your hands in the containers. Aveem is going to be able to help protect those workloads there. You think about, you know, Office 365 or Salesforce, Aveem can protect those workloads, your physicals, your unstructured data, um, those critical applications. Aveem has a, you know, solution for you. Not only can we back that up, we can also, you know, provide a variety of recovery scenarios, um, allowing you to get your data back up and running as needed and you know we've been hard at work over here we um, have veeam availability suite a uh, version 11a that's available for you to download and get started with um, one of the uh, products that's included in veeam availability suite is veeam one that's going to be that monitoring and analytics tool to help you monitor your environment uh, make sure everything's behaving as normal uh, for the cloud you know, we've released, you know, several uh, new versions of our Veeam backup for cloud products. Um, so if you have those workloads running in AWS, Azure, or the Google Cloud, um, take a look at uh, these because, you know, these are going to offer you, you know, grade A protection for those workloads. And then we have, you know, our Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator thinking about, getting started with orchestrating your disaster recovery plan, well, Veeam's got that solution for you too. And then protecting your uh, containers with casting K10 by Veeam, really giving you, you know, a variety of uh, data protection solutions for you to get started with. A lot of these products have a 30-day free trial, if not a community edition available. So uh, if you haven't started with Veeam, and you're new to Veeam, or maybe you're just getting started with cloud or containers, take a look at these. Um, I'm sure <laughs> you'll find them very easy to use and also very powerful. So I did, we did get some questions coming in here. 
um, we try to answer them throughout the webinar as um, we've been going through. Um, so let's see here, what do we got? Uh, we got a question. Um, we heard a lot about uh, ransomware uh, today uh, from our expert uh, over here, Dave. Uh, so what should a business look at recovering first? Or what are some frontline recovery strategies uh, would you recommend um, or some top resources that would need to be recovered? Uh, do you have an answer for that one, Dave? Yeah, absolutely, Kirsten. And from my experience, the number one things that typically come back first is your accounting department because you know we need to be able to run payroll. We need to be able to uh, pay our vendors. Um, so that's kind of the number one thing that we look at. But this should be something that you work with the business on as part of your business continuity and recovery plan. So in the event that, you know, the unforeseen happens and you are now just a statistic that's a company that's been impacted, um, you need to know exactly what you're going to recover and more importantly, where you're going to recover it to. Because like I said, if you get cyber insurance involved, they're going to be wanting to have a look at those systems for a little while. So maybe you have to have a parallel stream. And my biggest piece of advice is, don't be scared to pick up the phone and phone your cyber insurance vendors and find out if that is okay and if that is acceptable per your policy because you don't want to be doing anything that's going to impact your chances to uh, to to um, to get reimbursed inside of that policy. Great question, absolutely great question. Yes, um, I think we are probably at time, but um, we just want to say thank you all for you know attending our webinar today. If we didn't get to your question, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, ask our question, ask your question on Twitter, at Beam. Uh, if you follow us, um, any other last minute advice before we close out today, Dave? Uh, the only other advice that I have is if you have a chance, I just saw that, you know, we're going to be running for the first time in a while, Veeam on 2022 in Las Vegas make sure that you check that out. I'm going to be there. I'm going to actually be speaking in person, Kirsten. So if you want a chance to, to meet and uh, share a beverage, you know, we've actually got a chance. We'll be in Las Vegas, and I think it's in uh, May of this year. So that's really exciting. Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a good time. So thank you guys all today for attending our webinar.